I realized that there was something wrong, something wasn't right. I sat up in bed and there was this little guy in my bedroom. I am so emotional on a Mother's Day because my children nearly didn't have a mother. He took my entire life. South Africa, Johannesburg, also known as Egoli or Josie. Johannesburg is South Africa's largest city. Built on the discovery of gold in the late 1800s, Johannesburg has continued to lure people from across borders in search of wealth. It's a diverse, multicultural city and a melting pot of Africa. Johannesburg is extreme, enormously wealthy, and desperately poor. And it's for these reasons that thousands of people converge on the city of gold every year, most to seek out a fortune and some to steal one. The dark side of Johannesburg is reflected in the high crime statistics. So when a series of break-ins, violent assaults and robberies took place over a period of seven years, it failed to make headline news. The attacks took place in three provinces and began in 1999. None of the crimes were linked. But Tracy Goldblatt will never forget. She was a single mom at her parents' home with her kids on December 2nd. 2002. We'd gone to sleep and when I woke up, Brad had woken up as well, I think with a bit of a commotion going on there. And I just patted him on the leg and I said, boy, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Um, just relax, everything will be okay. Well, he was saying to me that um, he's going to rape me and that I should move over in the bed. And when I moved over slightly, um, he started undoing his pants and I kicked him. But at that stage, I mean, already a shot had gone off. And then he pulled me out of the bed, pushed me into the passage, and I pushed him from the gate into the little dining room area. And as he turned round, I'd locked the gate, and he started to scream. He's going, hey, 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 you can't do that. And when I'd locked the gate, he started shooting, and I closed the passage door as well. And I stood against the door, and I thought, I'm really not feeling very well. And when I turned around, there was just blood splattered everywhere. The burglar gets away with his assault on Tracy. He leaves no trail. He is spurred on to commit yet another violent crime. It takes him six months to choose his next victim. He breaks into the house of a 19-year-old woman and rapes her. Still feeling invincible 10 days later, the suspect gets a fright when two officers begin to follow him. Driving in an upmarket suburb, a high-speed chase ensues. Shots are fired, but the officers have no idea who they're chasing. The suspect drives over 200 kilometers per hour and jumps a traffic light, eventually colliding with a lamppost. He's unhurt and makes a run for it. He continues firing at the police. The suspect is shot and wounded. He gives them a false name, Koza. This is a scam he has almost perfected. He is searched and found in possession of a gun. He's also found with meat sausages, laced with poison. Aldicarb is an agricultural poison. It's fatal when fed to animals. He's taken into custody. Despite the arrest and evidence of Aldicarb, the suspect is granted bail within days. He slips through their fingers and is on the run again. Yeah. 10 months later on April 24, 2004, the suspect is again arrested, this time with housebreaking tools. True to form, he gives a false name, appears before the Pretoria Magistrates Court, is granted bail of 500 Rand, 
and walks out. A second failed arrest. This is just the beginning of a cat and mouse game this dangerous criminal begins to play. The quiet, tree-lined streets of an upmarket Johannesburg suburb become the next hunting ground for the brazen criminal. Roderick Charles Pringle still lives in the house in which he was attacked. His dogs were poisoned with aldicarb. The incident happened, it was about 3.30 in the morning. Um, so clearly he'd been around for a while because the barking happened about half past one or two. He came through that window. He then helped himself to a laptop in the study. I sat a bolt up in bed, and there was this little guy in my bedroom. And I used bad language to ask him. I asked him what he thought he was doing in my bedroom at that time of the day and get the hell out of there, thinking I might scare him. Well, you clearly don't scare this guy because he never moved a muscle except lift the gun. And so I sort of put my hand out. I don't know what you expect to stop a bullet with a hand, but you do. Turned sort of half away from him and said, all right, all right, all right, take what you want and go. And the next thing happened, he pulled the trigger. The bullet went in here, just on my collarbone. Um, and, and because I turned somewhat, it, it ricocheted off that into my, into my shoulder. He'd already got the keys to the car in his hand at that point, and he jumped in the car. There was a Labrador and a Jack Russell. They were poisoned so comprehensively they didn't even have time to swallow the sausages that the poison was in. It seems he's untouchable. The upmarket northern suburbs of Johannesburg are a soft target. As his confidence grows, so does the brutality of his crimes. He breaks and enters, then rapes his victims. In just three months, the suspect has raped three women two of them in just two days. One, a 21-year-old ballet dancer. And then, on December 17, 2004, the suspect moves 50 kilometers north of Johannesburg to the capital city of South Africa, Pretoria. Here, he brutally attacks Heidi Slot. I realized that there was something wrong, something wasn't right. And I think I must have been woken up by, by noises coming from my office. And um, I could see a light moving. It was all strange, I couldn't put it together. I switched on my bedside at lamp, and the next minute the door opened, and there was a man peeping around the door. And I immediately shouted like a crazy person, and I said, what are you doing in my house? Get out. His response was, I'll shoot you. And that was quite a chilling thing, because the next minute I realized, OK, he might be peeping around my bedroom door, but who else is out there? And he was shining a torch in my eyes, which was virtually blinding me. I couldn't, I couldn't really see him too well. And he made me sit on the, on the couch. And I said to him, look, whatever you tell me to do, I will do. I won't shout again. You are in control. I won't do anything. And he came back with a hairdryer and he tied my legs together with the hairdryer cable and he made me lie down on the couch. Then he took a wire from the loudspeaker that was behind my back and, he, and tied my hands above my head to the couch. That was the first time that I realized that I could come to bodily harm because um, for the first time I realized that he could actually hurt me, he could actually kill me. And he went and he got a knife from the kitchen. He came back and he was standing at the end of the couch and he said to me to open my legs. I said to him, well, I can't because you've tied my legs up. And he took the steak knife and he cut the electrical cord and he was taking his clothes off. And then I realized he was going to rape me. I started pleading with him. I said to him, you know, take whatever you like. 
You've got everything of value. I've got nothing else of value in this house, but leave me. Leave me. It's not necessary for you to rape me. And then he took the steak knife and he cut the jeans from the side, on both sides. He cut it and he pulled it off. And then he penetrated me. I think what was going through my mind mostly there was there were no physical sensations. At, at that particular point, I was in a very spiritual place. Yes, in the next minute, there was a car, a sound of a car approaching, very quiet street that I was living in. And he got a fright and he got up. And he went outside, went to have a look at what this car was doing there. And it was a car of a security company. He asked me how to open the gate. I said to him, well, you just push it open. And that's when I heard he reversed my car out of the driveway, stopped briefly, and then roared away. As the rape cases begin to pile up, the dockets land on the desk of Colonel Andre Nietlin and Captain Arnold Boenstra of the South African Police Sex Crimes Unit. And then we realized that there's a, a serial offender on the loose in Joburg. And by the fourth scene, they identified him on fingerprints on a bulb. One of our very uh, talented fingerprint people actually had a similar fingerprint etched in his mind. And he managed to pick up a fingerprint at one of our scenes that he remembers from other scenes. They slowly piece the story together. The same modus operandi in all the rape cases. The man who says his name is Koza is now wanted by the police. When he saw this fingerprint, he knew he saw it somewhere else. And this is how we identified Ananias Marty first. But at that stage, the name that was linked with the fingerprint was a Mr. Koza and not Ananias Mate. So we were chasing this Mr. Koza around and eventually through investigation and uh, with help of our colleagues, we managed to find out that this Mr. Koza is actually a false uh, uh, passport. His real name is Ananias Mate and he's from Mozambique, speaking to informants, examining cell phone calls and SIM card data. They crack the investigation. Police are tipped off. The South African Police Service pounce on Ananais Mate while he sleeps in his hideout. He is detained in a high-risk cell at the Johannesburg Police Station, but not for long. Two months later, on April 2, 2005, Mate successfully pulls off his first escape from a cell. He slips through the fingers of the police for the third time. The big frustration came when he uh, escaped from our own cells under our own control, which is specifically built to house these kind of criminals. The first escape happened when he broke off a pipe in the cells the pipe that leads to the central heating system. And he somehow managed to break open the bars, bolt himself with his blankets uh, rope, and climb down the rope, actually broke halfway. Mr. Marty was a very lucky man on a few occasions. He didn't get injured, he managed to get away. It was an embarrassment for us uh, that this person managed to escape out of our um, high-risk cells. Uh, there was a lot of pressure placed on us to track him down and arrest him. The team, which was a very big team, it consisted of specialists from our task force and dog unit, worked day and night. We worked nine months, sleeping on the back of buckies in the bushes, working with informers who told us he will be traveling this route, that kind of thing. By this stage, he has managed to gather a small fortune, stealing and selling cars and motorbikes. He even uses a stolen car to evade being captured at roadblocks. The investigation and hunt for Mate goes cold. Limpopo province, northern South Africa. Home to scenic bushveld 
and game reserves. It's the town of Tabazimbi, a fast-growing ecotourism area and also a sleepy mining town. Its tight-knit community enjoy a relatively crime-free existence until now. Die ochtend toe ek opstaan, half 7, het ek opgemerk my kom by stier staan waar by toe op. Um, dit was vir my snaaks gewees, want ek weet ek het alles gesluit. Ek het buiten toe gegaan, ek het opgemerk my voertuig is weg. Ek het die honde geroep, geen honde het nader gekom nie, ek het besef daar is iets fout die oorstak. Trouble that would terrify this town. A sinister character stalks at night. At first he waits in a garden until the house lights go off. He enters the house while the family is asleep and quietly removes the door lock and handles with a screwdriver. It was ongeveer so half drie die ochtend. Ek het wakker geword met a lichtje wat weer kaarts in die kamer en plek soos a cell phone wat wil af gaan wekker. Met die cell phone gaan toe nie afgee en toe ek omdraai en kyk, toe sien ek, hier staan iemand in die kamer. En op die stadium, toe grijp ek naam, ek skryf op hom en hy rik toe los, slaan die deur in my gezicht toe en hy hart op toe weg. Wat was vannig? Ja, dit gebeur vannig. Draai die sleel af binnen, weet, draai hem af en ek wil hoop sluit, dat ek my stond by jou aanstaan. Ek krijg die deur op, en toe is ek toegemaak in die kamer, ek kan nie uitkom, he. My man weet ons uit die slot achter los gemaakt en die assie uitgehaal, moet nie nekies aan neergesit, terwijl ons nog alleen slaap het. En alles is oor, wat ons die vorige aand toegesluit het. Die veiligheidshekke is allemaal sy slot te hang uit, alles is oor. I was woken up at about two o'clock by the dogs barking. I peeped through the window and I couldn't see anything. Fifteen minutes later, again, woke up and then I put the lights on and then I saw these meatballs lying on my stoop and I immediately realized that somebody was trying to poison my dogs. I had two bird bulls, uh, of which one died uh, on, on site here. And uh, that night I took the other one to the veterinarian. We later discovered that this particular person was looking for vehicles, particular 4x4 vehicles. The next day when they did the lifting of the fingerprints, he was identified as trying to jump over the wall at our home. But the dogs must have scared him off and he went back. Uh, next day we also found cans. We prepared the bully beef. We spiked it with the poison just on our neighbor's side of the fence. Yeah, we all two the hundred on the grass do it gele, so two or three meter out my car out. Yeah, it is not a lekker gesig nie. It is weet enige dier wat die mens so lank het is, maar soos 'n deel van die gesin waar al gele het. Ek was baie hard seer oor die honde gewees. Pressure mounts. The police have nothing to go on, with no identikit and no fingerprints. Residents take it upon themselves to form a neighborhood watch, patrolling at night in an attempt to catch the criminal. Nee, daarna, weet, kon ons glat hier nacht slaap, en hier, leem maar wakker, want die weet, die kom hier weer terug, wat kom soek, he? Want die police het self ons sê, hulle is bang, daar gaan iets ergs gebeur, weet, iemand gaan daar vermoor word, want niemand word gevang, en hulle krij nie die mense gevang, he? Toe ek die venster oopmaak, toe sien ek die veiligheidsheid is die automaal oopgetrek. Toe het ek achterom gehaard loop, op en achterom die huis en weer voor en toe gekom. En toe het ek gevind, my bakkie is weg. Ek het toe daar ingekom en toe begin politie bel. En ek het die opsporingsfirma wat die apparaat in my bakkie geïnstalleer het. Na een paar minuten meneer ons het die man op radar of klom opgespoor. Toe is die voertuig bezig om baie vinnig te beweeg in die richting van Johannesburg. Taba Zimbi is left reeling. The crimes bear the hallmark of a seasoned criminal. Anna Nice Mate has succeeded in hitting 28 houses and killing 13 dogs in just three days. And he's vanished again. By the end of October 2005, three months after he hits Tabazimbi, the South African Police Service declare Ananais Mate their number one most wanted criminal. They release his identity. Mate has now been on the run for six years. 
and that was my first encounter with him was on the headline of the Star newspaper. It was an absolute shock. After a tip-off, police finally come face to face with their man. Outside a hotel, they wait for Ananias. They're told he's staying there. We went up to the room where he stayed and where the co accused of his stayed. We searched the room, we found hijacked vehicles, keys inside the room. Captain Boonstra and one of our colleagues at that stage, Captain Van Vieren, was downstairs being the lookout. They had a description of a car, a Mozambique and Camry, coming over the hill. And as it pulled closer, it slowed down to see what's happening. And I noticed Marty sitting in the left passenger side. And he didn't see me standing next to the pole and I stepped right in front of the car and I managed to get him by the collar. I just got a frantic call saying somebody's very tight and saying we've got him, come and help us. And I pulled him out and he fell on the floor and Colonel Van Vieren jumped on him and we uh, managed to subdue him and then arrest him again. It was a massive fight. Uh, Mr. Marty is uh, he's quite a tough uh, character. Um, Captain Boonstra is a big guy, Van Vieren is a big guy and they really had their hands full to, uh, to, to, to contain him. Taking no chances, police lock Mate behind the iron gates of South Africa's notorious C-Max High Security Prison in Pretoria, once home to death row. Designed to house South Africa's most dangerous, hardened felons and serial killers. Between April and November 2006, Mate tries escaping more than three times from this prison. On the second occasion, wardens are summoned to Mate's cell. The window is damaged. He's moved immediately to a more secure cell. It makes little difference. November 18, 2006, seven years after he began his crime spree, the most wanted criminal escapes again. And my phone rang just after 12 at night, and uh, it was the head of the prison that informed me. He says, are you the investigation officer of, of Mata? I said, yes. He said, well, the man has escaped. A team of us went out to see Max. We went to investigate. And um, yeah, we were quite shocked. It makes national news. The headlines scream, impossible. He's dubbed Houdini. But the government spins their own story in an attempt to cover up an embarrassing situation. The Department of Correctional Services tells reporters Mate coated himself with petroleum jelly and squeezed through the cell window, which measured just 20 by 60 centimeters. South Africa's Houdini is on the move again, and no one knows how he did it, or do they? So when they said the guy ex escaped through a window, I know you know Pretoria Central Prison, there's no way unless you take the entire frame of the window. The Minister of Correctional Services, Mr. Nwande Balfo, I mean, came out publicly saying that um, there is this criminal, you know, he escaped, he used a Vaseline and all of that. I mean, all those things he told the public. We went out to CIMAX to, to see him and we allowed the media to uh, identify him as well, if they can. Journalists scrambled to get the details. They're skeptical about the Vaseline story. The allegations were apparently made that his family had paid 80,000 rent over to somebody. That 80,000, for me, confirmed that anything was possible because of he had people around him who needed him because of he knew how to, to, to get things in and out of the, of the country. All that we can do at that stage is we didn't know exactly where he was, but we could patrol main arteries, etc., looking for him. And we actually managed to find him on three or four occasions. He just slipped past us. For seven years, he continues to give police the slip. It's a massive manhunt. Roadblocks are set up on the outskirts of Johannesburg. Time and time again, Mate evades capture. Sometimes they even spot him. And then, He's gone. We called an off the suburban area where he went in and we searched there for about three hours. We found nothing. There's a name that is known about, I mean, he's known, you know, about in, in, in Mozambique. He's known as the Red. And when, when I tried to, to ask questions around it, I mean, the, the, the only answer that I got from the community is that, I mean, a Red, you'll never, you know, a, a pin a Red down. 
attention. Dominique Matlangu is following the story. He's a journalist at a South African Sunday newspaper. The real story still needs to be told. Aninas Mate, who is this guy? Now he's assigned to travel across the border from South Africa to Mozambique to unearth the truth about a man who no one sees but many know of. The more I probed, I discovered that I'm dealing with a very shady character. I mean, at some point he will operate with a gang, at some point he will um, operate alone. I didn't want just to believe what the police were telling me. Hence the decision to say, fine, we'll profile him in terms of information that we have in South Africa, but we need to go back to where he comes from, just to check who's this guy. That's when then I started to discover that he's not an ordinary criminal. Shai Shai is a small seaside town, north of the Mozambican capital, Maputo. Dominique has been told Ananais Mate grew up in a village close by. He sets out to find the family. He needs some background to find out what makes Ananais Mate tick. I realized that for me to operate freely, I had to just go and to the police station in the area. Then I went there to try and check that. And then the station commander, we spoke for about two to three hours, it was open up until I started to ask the first question that um, I'm told that um, some of the police officers in the area have benefited from Ananias, Ananias Martin, that they've always protected him. Are there any cases, you know, that you know of? And then he, the whole conversation changed. You know, he started asking me questions, you know, um, who are you? You don't have any, any right to come and ask these questions, you know, uh, this is not South Africa. I mean, as we drove in into that village, it's uh, in Shai Shai. It's not far from the main road. I mean, if you know Mozambique, is that it's got this one national road. And then we drove down the road, and, and I was surprised that this guy is building a mansion. I mean, if it is completed. When I counted, it had about six bathrooms that were planned, you know, a number of rooms. I mean, it's also a huge, huge yard. A grand display of wealth in a rural village the house Ananais Mate is building. So as we drove in there, there was his mother and the two wives and the kids. I mean, they welcomed us and then I introduced myself. And then they opened up. I mean, they told me his background. Mate went to school, played soccer, and was the eldest of four siblings. While his father worked on the mines in Johannesburg, 800 kilometers away, his mother turned to alcohol. There was little money, and his brothers needed food and clothing. Ananais was forced to leave school. His friend Thomas Sitole shared his childhood with Mate. Felistra is one of three wives Mate married. She was pregnant when he left Mozambique. That was in 2005. Since then, she hasn't seen him.
Between 1995 and his escape from CMAX, Ananais Mate took long road trips from his hometown in Mozambique to the city of Johannesburg, 800 kilometers away. He returns to the village in Mozambique often with brand new motorbikes, 4x4 trucks, and quad bikes. It's obvious they're stolen. No one questions him. Ananais Mate has been on the run for seven years. In that time, police have caught him four times. But each time, the slippery criminal with a knack of disappearing has evaded prison. Fifteen days after Ananais Mate's sensational escape from Pretoria's C-Max prison, Cameron Micklejohn is woken by footsteps in her Joburg home. At 10 to 6, I woke up and he was probably in the house from any time after 5 till about quarter past 6. He came through the door, obviously heard that I'd gotten up and he was armed and obviously I panicked and screamed and he said to me that I had to keep quiet and get back into the bed and he basically said to me and my daughter who just started to wake up that I must please keep quiet and put our heads down and, and he left. Probably about 10-15 minutes I could hear my car start and go down the drive. Next time on your mic, you're alone. Hi, and I'm a car. Where am I there? In the last 10 minutes. It was on a Monday morning. We received a phone call from the control room stating there was uh, a golf taken from a house robbery. Pitbull was my driver for the day and chased out. We were not aware we were really chasing a big boy. We proceeded there. They told us the helicopter is airborne already. It was the time of the morning, peak hour traffic. Tembisa is home to approximately 400,000 people. It's a massive, sprawling township on the outskirts of Johannesburg. Winding roads, informal settlements, and tightly clustered houses make it almost impossible to track someone. The chopper actually got the vehicle visually. When we got the vehicle visually, it was just pulling off the road. When he saw us turning towards him, then he started running. Don't stop! When he started running, he had uh, like a, a black bag. <laughs> At one stage, you could see I'm close to him. Then he took the bag that he had on his uh, shoulder, then he threw it onto a shirt. A smallish oak, he had an uh, orange shirt. He actually took off his shirt at one stage just to get away from the chopper. I mean, the chopper, normally they see the color of the shirt of the guy, and that's how they, they identify that. Then we told the chopper guys, we can't see the guy. And they told us, no, this guy ran into that house, so he should be somewhere there. It's early morning, and Joseph has lost sight of him. But the noise wakes the family inside the house that the chopper pilot has identified. So we start searching through the house. We were looking there for like 20 minutes. We couldn't find him. We said to the chopper, no, the guy is not here. For more than 20 minutes, Ananais Mate stands undetected behind a room divider. He was half naked. His T-shirt was off. He only had uh, his trousers on. And his T-shirt that he was wearing was rolled onto his left and uh, side. I actually grabbed him and we searched him and we took him outside. Then I told Pete Water, no, let's rather walk down to the parky through the main road. Pete said, no, the helicopter said it's easy for us to go through the fences. 
Just before we jumped the fence, the guy turned around and he stabbed me here. It was like blood oozing, my right hand side eye was closed, I couldn't see a thing. And as I was climbing over the fence, I heard the chopper screaming on the radio, the guy is running away. As I looked back, I saw Joseph chasing the suspect. The first turn he took, I saw, only saw blood in his shirt. It was blood all over his face, all over his shirt. And when I got there, I saw this big catch uh, uh, under his eye. When I ordered him, I gave him an order to stop. He didn't want to stop. Then I pulled out my farm, then I shot at him once, and then he still went. I gave him the second shot, he still went. I gave him the third shot, then he collapsed. What we figured out that under his shirt, he had a big screwdriver. They wanted to move him to Tembisa Hospital, but we got some information. There were people already waiting there with firearms, trying to help him to escape again. Then they had to reroute to Pretoria. My director, Dale, he called me and said, yeah, you've arrested Ananias Martin. It was my first day back from holiday. I actually went to Mauritius to go and catch a marlin, which didn't happen. But at the end of the day, I caught a bigger fish called uh, Ananias Mate. Mate is shot three times and is arrested. He had spent 15 days on the run. Under a heavy police escort, Mate is transported to the Johannesburg Supreme Court. Surrounded by nine policemen, armed with automatic rifles. The transport of him was a nightmare is to get him to and from court. It was also very demanding in terms of having to dedicate a whole lot of human resources to that lengthy court case. We definitely didn't want him to escape again. We had to transport him from Pretoria where we had a special cell bolt for him. He's charged with 64 criminal counts, including multiple counts of housebreaking with intent to steal, as well as rape, attempted murder, robbery with aggravating circumstances, escaping from custody, and other violent crimes. David Motibe and Shabnam Singh are appointed to represent the state in what becomes a lengthy and complicated trial. I started to hear about Ananias Mati then in the news. I would say within a few weeks after receiving the matter, and I learned that there's a serious case that I was given to do. When I arrived, I was um, allocated to Advocate Matiba to assist with uh, to assist with the matter. It was like uh, any other case. The only difference was that uh, it had many dockets, many charges. I would say that he carried the biggest burden of this matter because he did the majority of the presentation of the state's case. I had to consult with the victims of the sexual assault. We ensured first that they had been taken to court for court preparation to familiarize themselves with the um, court atmosphere to make them more comfortable. So when I got to court, I looked at him and, yes, he's a small little man. He, he looked almost pathetic. And I knew that he was pure evil. It's not something that people come through every day in their lives or experience every day in their lives. You think of the most unpleasant sexual experience that you had and you put um, this victim in a court full of strangers, it's very difficult for them to relay their experiences. Yes, emotionally, I think it did a lot of damage. But physically, I came out of it with bruises around my, my wrists. That was, that was all. So while he was raping me, it was almost as if let the time pass, he's doing this to your body. And your, yeah, I suppose that's the closest that I've ever come to separating who I really am from my body. Heidi had a breakdown and contemplated ending it all. She lost everything. She lost her business, her home, and finally had to send her son to live with her family. We had called over 200 witnesses in this matter. It was extremely traumatic to put the victims through that experience again. And um, he showed no remorse when they were testifying. 
the type of sarcasm that they had to endure and the type of, of, of emotional breakdown that he subjected them to was, were, uh, I think, was very traumatic for them. He was like here in front of me, looking at me. And every time uh, I, uh, I was testifying, he was looking at me, laughing. But he's a little man, a little as I come right after life, I'm going to go But I had for my shoe to stand and look in the hole. I had for my gelach. I can see I feel next. He sits there with his family behind him, sniggering and chatting. When I went to court, I went down the stairs, and he was sitting at the bottom. And I turned to look at him because I needed to close that chapter. I forgave him because I know for a fact that forgiveness is a very liberating thing. It's a very liberating thing, and it cuts ties between yourself and that person. And I certainly didn't want to have any ties to him. Mate claims he can't speak English. Leontina de Almeida is brought in to interpret. She thinks his character is unnerving. He didn't come across as a baddie. He came across as the soft-spoken person who, very small, you know, bolt. It's hard to believe that he did the things that he did. He, he actually told me that people respected him in the prison because he was the only person that managed to escape in the manner that he did. Evidence against Ananais Mate is overwhelming. A packed gallery listens intently as details of his escape play out. He had used the sides of his bed to cut an upside down V, and if you looked at it, one could actually use it to open up the nuts or bolts on the side of the bed. He had also used uh, a piece of steel about that size, bent it into the shape of an S. And if you look at it from the photographs that were shown, pieces of clothing were attached to this S shape and he could use it as a hook to throw it into the window and then climb out. Judge Geraldine Borchers is told by a psychologist that Mate ran away from home to join Frelimo, freedom fighters who fought for liberation in Mozambique in the 1980s. That's the story Mate has maintained all along. During the trial, we had uh, a report which uh, I would say to a certain extent confirmed that rumor. Mr. Mate's uh, military background is still highly disputed. The mother told me that at some point when Aninias grew up, he simply walked out. Yes, he may have been trained as a soldier, but soldiers are, are, are trained to protect and serve, not to do the things that he did. The psychologist also says Mate suffers from antisocial personality disorder and that he shouldn't be given a life sentence. Contrary to what the victims feel, the psychologist argues Mate is remorseful and will rehabilitate himself. But Mate refuses to testify. The court doesn't get to see his so-called remorse. After a marathon trial lasting three years with over 200 witnesses, finally, the verdict. The judge finds Ananais Mate guilty. South Africa's Houdini is sentenced to an effective 54 years in prison. No sign of remorse as Mate smiles and gives the thumbs up. He just came across as a very intelligent individual, probably the most complex case that I've worked on. I found him to be an extremely charming man. He came across as a charming guy, friendly, well-spoken, soft-spoken. I think he's, he's uh, uh, more intelligent than the average person. I mean, he came across as someone who was so innocent. You know, uh, people are just creating the stories around him. I mean, when, when you sit down with him, he can convince you. He can tell you that, no, it's not me. You know, he's that, he's that kind of a character, you know, he, he, he wins you over, you know, with uh, his conversation. And uh, if, you, if you fall for that, you are in for a surprise.
Kokstad Super Maximum Prison is where Mate will spend the next 54 years of his life. Supposedly South Africa's most secure prison. A few still believe Mate could pull off his third Houdini escape. We actually flew him down there with unplanned flight plans, etc. That facility goes to the extent where they don't even allow personal contact between the prisoners and the personnel. I believe he's uh, well locked up. It'll take some time, but he'll come out. He's done it before, he may do it again. He said when he left the prison, he would have a party and I would be invited. There was a reason. There was a reason for this man to come into my life and create havoc and blow my entire life apart.